Welcome to Reader Syndicate 3.0, the next evolution of the look into counterculture that is canon. My name is Matthew, owner of Riot Seeds, and this started as a one-man mission for strain history and breeding science. Over time, it's evolved into something bigger, better, and more of a team effort. We will be joined by members of the Can Illuminati and other friends throughout the seasons to hear their takes on grow techniques, breeding science, strain history, and more. Our mission is to combat the narrative that corporate cannabis and seed posers are obfuscating for their own financial benefit. Welcome to the underground. We are the Syndicate. Nice. Um, So I can talk a little bit about what I've done the last two years, um, a little more in depth, but uh, I generally run and build a soil soils. They're really easy. And here in Colorado, at least they've been relatively cheap. Um, I do try to reamend all my pots after flower. I throw, I break everything down. I throw it back into the build a soil bag and I literally just layer with amendments and I would just leave them on my balcony for months until I needed more soil and I'd go right back to them. Um, but for when I was actually transplanting into pots and one gallons, when I was trying to pack enough food into heavier feeders, I would do something like fill up the pot, maybe a third of the way, just so it's open and easy. And then I would slowly add a handful of worm castings, um, usually around a cup ish of worm castings. And then I'll do a cup of compost, a cup, a pinch of something like Kashi blend or, um, a, a lighter, quicker release amendment mix, just something to kind of give it a, a little bit boost of immediate food within the actual media. And then I'll go a little bit more soil and then another cup of compost, another cup of worm castings and kind of just slowly mix it all together within the pot, then create my hole and transplant directly from clone. Um, that would usually fill up my, I ran the plastic one gallon bags, just the cheapy ones. Um, I don't like air pruning pots or fabric pots. I've found that they um, are really good homes for fungus gnats or uh, root aphids. And both of those really suck. And I would highly advise against those. But um, that's just an- off my anecdotal experience. But uh, I would allow the pot to es- or the plant to essentially root up within that three quarters of a full bag. And then the top dress, I would literally unfold the top of the bag and I would just dump more worm castings and another uh, pinch of Kashi blend. And then I'd throw some more soil on top and kind of just work it in with my fingers, give it a light pack. And that would more often than not, there was, I, I think I found maybe two or three plants in two years that wanted a lot more food than what was in there. Everything else pretty much allowed me to ride it out with, uh, that like a more than content amount of food for the plant um i it will kind of sacrifice yield going on going that way but that is the least of my selection pressures um i'm entirely focused on the high of the plant and the flavor of the plant i want it to taste good and i want to enjoy the effect of it if it doesn't taste good and it doesn't (laughs) and it doesn't give me a good high I, i don't want anything to do with it i don't care how much it produces um so Yield for me is not something that's built into something that I need within that way of growing, Um, but it allowed me to get a really good base level of each pheno that I ran through in that time and gave me a really good idea of like, okay, I know I need for this specific pheno, it needs more food at this time, otherwise it'll start yellowing on me early or it'll give me a, a weird color fade and I know that that can kind of refer to like maybe a phosphorus issue or a calcium, any one of those might kind of factors. But for me personally, when I'm growing in those pots, that's kind of the general system I've roughly developed for myself. Yeah, Carl, any thoughts on, you know, containers, different sizes, different approaches, smaller containers, larger containers, beds? Uh, no, because I pretty much went over that earlier. I, you know, I, I yeah. only do the one gallons and, you know, I used to do the two gallons, but it was just taking up too much room. And, uh, yeah, I found one gallons. I'm able to, just, I'm able to do it. I'm able to get it through, uh, even, you know, uh, 
man, I've gone, I've gone pretty, pretty long in one gallons actually. <laughs> well, I talked, I think I talked about that last time. I had an Isaac Hayes. I mean, that thing just kept going and going and going in a one gallon, and it was, it was, it was, past, it was past 120 days. I mean, easily, and it, it just never ran out of whatever. So I just don't, I, I never understood it. Um, yeah. So the, the, there's nothing really too much to add, I don't think. So. No, that's all good. Uh, Bumke, any any other prompts from this topic of like pot sizes and stuff? Yeah, I can kind of do like a rough little treatise on like beds versus bigger pots and smaller pots from my understanding. Um, it, it seems that beds are the most convenient and are like the most convenient in my opinion um, because it's kind of like a set it and forget it for the most part minus the occasional top dressing and amending that it needs to go on in between or in the flower cycle. Um, but my one issue that I do have with beds is that if you do get any sort of soil burn pathogen, you're essentially screwed. Um, like if you're running a bed and something like fusarium gets into it, like just horrible luck, but I don't necessarily know if there's a way that you can save that from infecting everything else that's within that same media. Um, obviously that would have to be done from like a clone coming in somewhere else or you contracting it from somewhere. Um, but, um, larger pots I feel would be like the most ideal way to grow organically. Obviously they take up a lot more space and they're a little bit better for bigger plants. Um, so if you're confined to space, that's the one issue with larger pots, but I feel it's the closest thing to a bed, but it still allows you to have multiple individuals that you're taking care of rather than one large bed that you're, has everything in it. Um, smaller pots are very much doable, but it breaks a lot of the traditional organic system methodologies. Um, and that largely comes back to just being conscious of like plant size going into flower. Like for example, you wouldn't want to flower a plant that's 30 something inches tall, like close to a meter high it's not going to essentially go over very well because at week three or four, that plant's going to be done with stretch. And if it's a big stretcher, you're going to have a five, six foot plant that's going dry every five to six hours because it has to drink <laughs> that much water to keep itself alive. And your media just can't contain that much water. So it's like, um, there's different ways to do it for different people. And so you can do like the small pot, with smaller plants and you can run like a larger amount of phenos in a smaller space. Uh, if you have the space and that's not an issue and you're kind of just looking for a more ease of growth, tr like water only type of method, I would recommend like a larger pot or even the, the two by four beds like Scruson's doing. That's a great way to do. Even if you wanted to do a couple larger plants, you could do three, maybe four couple foot plants easily in that space. Um, so oh. yeah, that, it's kind of the different ways that you can go about it within the different pot size. You can you can do pretty big ones in there, right? What I usually try and do though is flip them small so that I can pack in more, because um, I'm I'm looking for stuff, you know. Yeah, and I think to me one obviously one high level reflection that I have on all of this is obviously there are trade offs with every every approach. There there are different risks with the different containers, um, and. Okay, this is not in the outline at all, but I thought I would ask you guys, like, what have been some, speaking of risks, right, what if, what have some things that have gone wrong for you guys? Just as like a, a little break from the, you know, the other topics, like, what are some of the, the major, like, fuck-ups that have occurred, or not fuck-ups necessarily, because it's not always your fault, but, yeah, what are some of the biggest disasters you guys have encountered? Uh, I, my first run in a two by four, I had two 20 gallon pots in there with two plants. I put the seeds in the pot and literally started to have plants at 12, 12. Um, I overwatered one of them on like, I want to say something like day 20 something when the plant was like eight inches tall and it just fell over and uh, like literally went wet and limp wet noodle on me um and so that run i yielded a total of six grams from my other 10 inch lollipop 
So yeah, no, you can definitely kill things real quick if you're not paying attention. <laughs> Kyle Skirsten, any any fun disasters to tell us about? Uh, yeah, well, no, mine I pretty much talked about last time. It was pretty much that Isaac Hayes where I think it was pretty much the heat, which uh, well, I'm kind of dealing with now. Everything's doing a foxtail thing because uh, since I'm a night grower, my plants don't get time to cool down. They are basically growing all the time because during the day it's obviously hot and uh, I can't cool it down because I'm in the garage. So, uh, you know, it's, um, it's uh, something I deal around. It just looks because in TLO anyway, my plants are not going to look like anything in an, any other organic system or synthetic. Um, so I have to always remember that too. My stuff definitely is, won't look like other people's when they finish and all that too. So, um, but every, but pretty much I've dealt with uh, all the little problems that have come along, you know, uh, overwatering, underwatering. Uh, mostly I deal with a lot of potassium because uh, obviously with the heat, uh, it, my plants are uh, exerting a lot of um, uh, moisture and stuff during their nighttime. So I am constantly dealing with that. Uh, but I don't ever try to uh, goose them uh, or, you know, put extra stuff in them because then that'll obviously mess stuff up, especially uh, during the second half of flower. Um, cause from what I understand, especially phosphorus, the plant holds it for about 20 days or so. So I never had any, do anything, do the second half of flower or anything like that. Um, yeah, I think that's, but that's pretty, pretty much the only major one that I've had. I've had bugs and stuff like that from maybe the compost, but that was mostly when I was in my apartment when I was first starting out. And that was only for like six months. Um, I had uh, all the, the fungus gnats and stuff because I was trying to do the compost inside. And yeah, that's fun trying to get rid of all those in an apartment when you had to worry about inspections and stuff like that. So that, that was a fun, learn, fun, fun learning experience. Luckily I could just took it right outside my, uh, my front door and uh, everything eventually went away. <laughs> so I eventually, I eventually figured it out and uh, yeah, luckily we got a house. And so, but uh, yeah, I just kind of deal with stuff as it comes up, but I got the basic problems. Bugs come up and you know, you just deal with them and you know, with my IPM or whatever I do. So yeah, that's basically it for me. Thanks, Kyle. Screw? Uh, yeah, I got a couple of, of mess ups. Uh, first first round in the bed, because I, I, I flower in two by fours, because when I first started uh, growing again, I was also in an apartment, and I had to do it all in the two by four. Um, and I... I don't know. I guess I realized that plants don't really drink much towards the end of flowering uh, because I watered in six gallons of water like it was because they were just raging. I watered it in and it completely destroyed that carpet. <laughs> um, <laughs> I uh, Also, um, you know, uh, the little isopods those little pill bugs mm -hmm. well yeah yeah they're beneficial but to an extent <laughs> yeah when they get to a high enough population they start eating, eating your plants like yeah. chewing them down like they're like they're beavers it's crazy it's wild. and i had that problem uh for quite a bit uh if you end up running into that just use a beer trap it's the fastest way to just knock them out and then, I mean, I guess the mites, the mites and throat issue that I got from that clone that I've received, uh, <laughs> the clone that, that you know, that kind of fucked my shit for a while because uh, <laughs> I wasn't able to flower for months. Yeah, that's, just fighting that's them. That's terrible. That's horrible. but I don't think that's really system. Uh, system dependent. No. I definitely, I guess, it, it is a lot harder though because. You know, with thrips, I'm pretty sure that those, you know, um, like infect soil and stuff. So, yeah, it yes, was, they, they, oh, I was going to say, yes, yeah, so I know a lot of people don't know they will hibernate in soil because actually I get them once it starts to heat up here. Uh, so I deal with that every, every year. 
so I have to use the bring out the spinosad and um, yeah, but they they will hibernate in soil. That's not a lot. I had to kind of dig in the research surprisingly for that, but yeah, I found that out that they will do that much, and that's from people also over the years finding out that they get the same thing. It's mostly when it's the heat. Once it starts to heat up, they come out of the soil. So, I mean, yeah, and I will point out that I guess being you know having a large bed. It kind of goes back to what Bombcat was saying, I think, uh, or at least alluding to, which is that it's hard. To, it's much harder for you to like separate, you know, quarantine individuals from each other, right? Like they're all in the one thing, and so they're one system essentially, one ecosystem. Um, yes, that yeah. is there. That is definitely a big drawback to it. Um, and you know like when you're when you're leaving it in there a lot of people just leave their they'll just cut the base of their plant and like leave the root ball and all that shit but over years you're you're asking for um those uh root nematodes and shit to pop up yeah it's more um, victories right of like possible yeah uh, yeah so they, like i i have to i water in um predatory nematodes every month about every four or five weeks i water them in just to try and you know have a chance at it at, at keeping that at bay um but i might switch over to just replace my soil every three years because that seems to be the point where it's still just rocking and not not having i'm not having to deal with too much you know Okay. I feel like this um, might be a. I feel like this might be a good time to slide into maybe a little bit of IPM tips and tricks yeah, for yeah, yeah. I was organics. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it, man. Kick it off. All right. Um, so I use a couple different things. Um, I was given a bottle of Pyganic. It's a insecticide and fungicide. I know it's not necessarily organic, but that shit really helps. <laughs> it's super expensive, um, like almost prohibitively expensive, um, but it really does help um, if you're having like a, any type of insect, like insect, soft body insect problems or like major fungus issues. Um, I'm not entirely sure about root, like drenching it kind of thing, um, but for any like powdery mildew or anything that's actually eating the bi like biomass of the plant, that goes a really long way. Um, otherwise, I honestly got my IPM recipe that I've been using for years now from uh, the one of the episodes on the podcast. Um, but uh, it's essentially just uh, Dr. Bronner's mint soap, the um, at one ounce per gallon. Um, if you're really like dealing with something on your leaf surface, I would recommend maybe doing two ounces per gallon, but definitely make sure those plants are dry before you throw them back under the lights. Um, the, <laughs> this, the mint will absolutely destroy your leaves if you put light on it. So, uh, don't do that. I've learned that lesson as well. Um, also doing something like one ounce per gallon of isopropyl, 99% isopropyl or, um, 3% hydrogen peroxide. Super great for killing any sort of powdery mildew problems. Um, a couple days back to back in a row of the mixture of the two should pretty much cure any issue with that. Um, the... Dr. Bronner's Bastille soap is super great for any type of uh, soft body insect that you want to get rid of in your actual media. Um, they breathe through pores on their sides, so it essentially does the same kind of thing as um, like uh, horticultural oil, where it, it when you get it wet and you foam it up and you shake it and then you spray it into your uh, or pour it into your um, soil, it will cause essentially an oil coating to go over those pores and the insects immediately suffocate and die. So it's the same um, mode of action in that. Uh, you can also do things like um, a saponid extract from something like soap nuts for like a really good um, foliar to help aid with just any type of um, uh, like mildew or PM type issue. Uh, there's all sorts of other ones I can get into, but I'll let the other two start. Yeah, guys, IPM. But I mean, Scrooge already touched on his, I guess. So, Kyle. 
Uh, yeah, uh, basically the only thing I really do is I use uh, Double Death Nematodes from uh, Nature's Control. Uh, I use that in my soil uh, every... They call uh, what? It's called... Uh, du- du- they're called uh, Double Death Nematodes. They call uh, Double Death. That's metal. Double shot. Death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's why. So, yeah, it, it, <laughs> it, it definitely takes out everything. You won't see anything uh, uh, flying around or moving around for uh, a little while. And the plants uh, actually enjoy it. You can actually see them. They, they perk up a little bit. Uh, I've always used those because so, obviously, like I, I said, I found out that the thrips, they will stay in the soil. So I definitely, I do use that every maybe 60 days or so. Um, you, you're supposedly supposed to be able to use that as a foyer. I've never used that. Uh, I don't really do any of that stuff, um, except when I do see, if I do start to get see the thrips because something happened or they came in, I just use the spinosad. And um, I use, uh, I mulch, so I don't really have to, like, cover my soil or anything like that. Uh, and I just take take them in the bathtub and spray them and, until they're dry and then put them back in. Um, I really don't have too much of an IPM because uh, I, I, bugs are normal for me. Uh, if I don't see bugs, uh, then uh, something's going not not right because <laughs> it technically it is living because so, so if i don't see a bunch of stuff uh as long as it's not on the plants uh they're micro micro species is well you know how we think of them um uh yeah you know i, I kind of want to see living stuff so i got a couple more tips and tricks i just thought of um diatomaceous mm-hmm. earth super super helpful with like anything that you want to essentially like a overpopulation of anything in your soil. Um, I would imagine it's probably really good for something like uh, root aphids or even fungus gnats. Um, I've seen it work wonders personally on fungus gnats. Um, Also a mustard seed meal. Uh, I was very skeptical when I first came across this, but I found a white paper a while back. I'll have to dig in and see if I can find it. Um, That essentially said, uh, it, 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 it was the first time I've ever seen this term, but biofumigation. Uh, essentially what happens is when you put the actual mustard seed meal onto the soil and you get it wet, what happens is the actual fumigation process where the top couple inches, which is where the majority of your issues will reside if there's an overpopulation of any type, will essentially get fumigated out by poisonous mustard gas that's released once it gets wet. Um, I've done it a couple times when I've had a fungus gnat issue in flower, like just a, a light sprinkle of like a teaspoon or so on my soil, get it wet. And usually within two or three days, it's pretty much 90% knocked out, whatever the problem is. Um, that one's super, super helpful. Uh, I had one more, but I lost it. (laughs) That's all right. Um, there was, and I don't know if you, you, you want to move yet, Bumcat, but, uh, I saw that there was also mention of pH management. Uh, was that an in, was that something you want to get into? Yeah, we can talk on it a little bit. Um, so we can do like different perspectives on pH. Um, for me personally, I don't whatsoever at all. Um, I've never owned one. I don't think you need one to grow good weed in soil, um, but I do think that they can only help. Uh, the reasons I don't pH anything is because first of all, those meters are damn expensive and they are not made to last. Those things break so easy and they are not cheap to replace at all. Um, so that's the first reason. And then the second, the second major reason is that if you're looking at the theory, theoretically, your if you have a healthy organic system, the media should itself should act as a pH buffer. So you're not necess- like when you're feeding in an organic system, you're feeding more so the fun- like the fungus and the bacteria than anything else. And that's what's facilitating that exchange of food within the media. So you don't necessarily need to moderate the pH because the microbes themselves and their natural populations and the fungus or the fungal network within the, that media are actually what exchange um, the pH back and forth. So like I've, I've wa- I I brought home a, a pH uh, meter from work one day just out of curiosity to test what my watering can was because I just have one of those cheapy weed sprayers from Home Depot. Uh, it's like a ten dollar pump sprayer kind of thing. I dipped the pH meter in there and it was reading like three point seven. 
I watered it in that night and I came back and everything was praying just fine. I didn't have any issues whatsoever with that. So it's like off anecdotal experience in myself, I've never necess- seen a necessity to have a pH meter if you're growing in like an organic system. Thoughts from the other two? Yeah, well, just about the whole pH um, in your medium in a in like a proper, you know, the type of potting soil that we're trying to create. It's that pH isn't even constant throughout the media. Um, it alters based on, you know, what micro population is there in like, you know, within the media. So even I don't know, even just giving it. Um, as long as your pH is relatively fine, which most people have normal water coming out of their sinks, uh, you should be all right. And if you're curious about that, water tests are actually pretty cheap. You you can pretty much find them locally wherever you are, at least here in the U S can't speak about Kiwis. Sorry, thousand. Um, but yeah, you can get that tested super easily. You can pretty much send it off anywhere. There's a lot of places that do it. You just pop in Google and it'll come up. Um, but that'll give you like a full breakdown of what's actually in your water coming out of your faucet. And if you need to do anything, um, in the U S a lot of taps, a lot of tap systems run a small amount of chlorine in there to prevent, uh, any type of, uh, buildup within pipes. So I, if I ever ran something out of the faucet i'd make sure i put it through something like a brita filter or just a really simple like one stage water filter to try and get as much of that out as possible it's not going to be absolutely perfect but it'll definitely help or you can let it sit out if it's regular chlorine it'll dissipate over time that's cool i think just randomly but where i am you can actually get reports uh, I think the reports online from like your local council, whatever, water people. Um, and they tell you like, since they last test and monitoring, like what, how much of what is in the water, which is pretty cool. That's how it is here too. I yeah. think they do it like yeah. quarterly or something. Yeah. Um, anything else on this topic, Bumcat? I think that kind of covers that one. Um, and, yeah, and then for, for what I use for pH is this dolomite lime. So I try to get mine about uh, seven mm-hmm. seven point oh, which is neutral, because uh, I believe that that's basically what most cannabis likes. Uh, is, you know what I've at least found. Um, I, I pH. I did have a meter in the very beginning when I made my very very first batch of soil, and it was exactly what. Uh, was in the book so it was uh, after that I never used it and actually the thing just uh, broke I don't even know what happened to whatever that is fancy the blue lab pen was it was fancy after a while I looked at it and I was like oh the thing's broke anyway so I know and I've never used one but uh, I use fast acting dolomite lime in my water Uh, I send it through a filter uh, tap through a filter first and um, then I build my water up with uh, fast acting dolomite lime for to uh, get it to 7.0 basically so and then obviously I have stuff in my soil that buffers it to that because I have more dolomite lime in the soil and that type of stuff. So. I will say um, I've heard Tad Hussey from Kiss Organics who he has like a whole podcast where he gets like really deep into soil science and stuff. Um, I've heard him recommend between like 6.5 and 6.7 in general if you're using like a living soil type system. So if you are looking to pH something in a soil system, I would recommend aiming for somewhere in that range. Yeah, that's funny you said, because I believe mine was, uh, in the very beginning, it was at 6.7, once everything was all cooked and everything after about 30 days, so. Oh, so we have, I would say, maybe 20 to 30 minutes left, and uh, Bumcat, there are a couple of, what was this, so there's like, growing organically in confined spaces, we sort of have touched on that. I don't know if that's something you wanted to talk more about. And then we have general tips and maybe like controversial points of discussion. Uh, I'll I'll let you decide like, you know, what do you reckon we should talk about? Um, I feel like we can go into the general tips area. Um, Mm -hmm. I have a couple down, um, but at least for me, like learning the system, 
Um, the biggest pitfalls coming into growing indoors um, organically is watering and not knowing what or why you're watering at um, like specific additives. Um, everything that you put in your water to go into your media, you should have a general understanding of what's relatively going to be happening um, and the amount of water that you're putting into your soil. Um, I heard Screw mention six gallons earlier. I've done very similar things and found that it, all of a sudden the plant is just, it's, you might as well just cut it out because it's not going to grow anymore. Um, but yeah, I believe that essentially watering and understanding what's in that water and why you're doing that is a huge one. Um, if you don't know, ask questions. You would be absolutely amazed at who is willing to answer you. Um, my DMs are always open if anybody ever has any questions, obviously. But I've gone to growers that I really respect on Instagram, and I've just sent them a DM out of, out of the blue, hoping maybe that they can get back to me with an answer. And more often than not, it's like 90% of the time, somebody will come back and give you some really good advice or maybe something to think about that can help. It's all people are always there. Don't be afraid and don't be, don't let your ego not let you ask questions. There's always something to learn and somebody can always teach you something. Even if it's wrong, you'll learn that it's wrong eventually. Um, organic. Yeah. Get, join our discord. That's the, that's the perfect that's big point one. to do a bit of shilling. But yeah. Join, join the community. <laughs> that organic forum in the discord is awesome. I love going in there and reading and catching up. Who started that? Days. I'm not sure. Or, like, or maybe it was just there, but I guess there are a number of threads in it now. That's cool. I haven't actually looked into it in a bit. Yeah, go give it a read so. if you're in the Discord. It's it's super fun. Everybody's really nice and always willing to help. Um, everybody's pretty positive in there and always a good time. Um, but uh, biggest advice for growing in organics in general is keep it simple. This plant can get really complicated really, really, really fast. Don't overcomplicate things. If you're confused, just fall back to the basics, water and soil. If the food, if there's food in the media, the plant will feed itself. If you're worried about overwatering, give it a couple hours, come back and check on it. There's more than a million ways to come back and come, like look at the plant to make sure it's okay. Um, a lot of people like to drown their plants with love. That's a very common mistake as well in organics. Um, cleanliness in general, Everything in organics is about staying five steps ahead of all the pests in every regard. It's an absolute pain in the ass, but it's essentially really the only way. Um, if you get a really bad uh, overpopulation of something in your soil, if you get like uh, a, like isopods were mentioned earlier, or fungus gnats or root aphids, if you're in an individual pot, you can pull that pot out and get rid of that plant. Um, but there is also the thought that don't be afraid to run a crop to harvest. Um, even if you panic and think it's going to be run, uh, like ruined, you can always learn something from taking something to the end. Um, I've taught myself a whole bunch of stuff of like, you can rebound a plant pretty well, even when you think it's gone. You, sometimes you can just baby it back. Um, Another big one is don't be reliant on specific companies or products, uh, meaning if you find something you get a positive result from, keep using it, but also understand what the ingredients are in that product that's creating that positive reaction that you want. So that way, if the product ever goes out of stock or is no, no longer sold, you have a means of understanding what was happening and you can go find a replacement product that is just as good or maybe even better. Um, yeah, that's kind of my my general tips for organics mm -hmm. what about yeah kyle and skruston on uh, you know on reflection you know what would you what would you what advice would you give people who are maybe starting or thinking about starting organic yeah i would definitely uh start out uh, i would have started out more simple uh you know i i do delve right in but i kind of knew what i wanted to do beforehand because I'd already, you know, I've already started 
you know, reading about stuff and doing all that. So I kind of knew beforehand, but uh, yeah, cause you can do basic, real basic stuff. And um, luckily with the Rev's new book, I mean, he has real simple recipes that you can do to even just do trial runs. So that way, if it's uh, something that uh, you just don't like, you can, you, you know, you didn't waste a lot of time. Um, yeah. That's it. Oh, I, well. yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, uh, yeah, I mean, bum cat, he pretty much, uh, a lot of the stuff he just said was, you know, it's pretty good, you know, um, you know, I, I don't stay ahead of the pest maybe as I should, but you know, to, like I said, you know, uh, I like to see stuff because my systems is a little bit different than just a basic, uh, well, not basic, but just, a the normal living soil of what people think type of thing. Cause TLO is its own thing, uh, in and of itself. So, Cool, man. Thank you. Skirsten, any, yeah, tips? Uh, probably the, the biggest tips, I don't know, I guess the most problems I see people having are watering either too little or too much or too frequent. Um, and like light intensity. Most, most of the time, if you just, if, if you got like problems going on, Either dim your lights or raise them and focus in on how you're watering. And that until you start to actually learn the system a little bit better, that is going to be most of your problems. Because you see people who, you know, start out, oh, is it a, is it a mag issue? Is it a, you know, calcium problem? You know, when really they just need to be more consistently um, watering correctly. Yeah, yeah, I definitely have seen this a lot where you can get, from watering issues, you, you do get downstream lockout deficiency issues. So it's not always a direct diagnosis. Like if you see, uh, you know, leaf chlorosis, necrosis, it doesn't immediately mean that it's a nu nutrient issue, although it, it, it could be a nutrient issue, but it could be caused by an upstream watering problem, right? And that's where people go especially when they're new and um, instantly try to like change five things uh, and just get like way more confused, way more lost <laughs> in troubleshooting. Yeah, especially with uh, overwatering because uh, I, I, I'm a constant over, that's one of, that's my main thing even since I was first starting, you know, that's mostly what a lot of people do is overwater over a lot of stuff. And I, I still am, I still have that problem of slightly overwatering stuff. Um, and that, that what I believe causes a potassium issue, which then causes magnesium and all kinds of lockouts and stuff afterward. So. Which is, yeah, which, is and, which, and actually, it, which, which, which usually is what you see a lot of the organic, a lot of the droopiness. And uh, that's usually the, what I, it's usually the overwatering. You can really see it, especially in uh, the organic beds and stuff like that. A really good Very general nice. rule I've found uh, based off of experience that I got from um, one of the build a soil videos way back in the day was uh, roughly, five, you want to water roughly about five to 10% of your total uh, volume of soil if you're watering in organics. Um, so for example, if you're in like a 10 gallon pot, you're going to water, water somewhere in the range of a half gallon to a whole gallon total for every time that you water. That's obviously not going to be that exactly every single time. It's going to be very much based on individuals and their preferences. Um, but that generally will give you a really good guide of watering, but not over watering or over loving the plant when you're actually going back into, um, doing that awesome okay um any other i don't know yeah anything else here bumcat general tips um uh, don't be reliant on any individual um, that's right be diversify your sources of information somebody can always teach you something no matter what you've heard from somebody else um, if they're doing something wrong, you'll learn in time that you're doing something wrong. Or if you're willing to do the research, you might learn a little bit faster, but always diversify where you're getting your information from, because somebody can always teach you something. You never know what it's going to be. Is this a good point, um, for me to ask you guys to like, maybe shout out some of the most important books, articles, whatever that you've, you've found? 
Um, yeah. Do you have any of those? Yeah, I can go a couple right off the top of my head. Um, the KNF manual, super helpful. Um, give you gives you like really detailed breakdowns of different styles of fermentation and all that stuff. Jam is also very similar. Um, you can literally just pop those. Literally KNF and J A D A M are the two spellings, and you literally just pop them into Amazon. And the books will pop right up. They're translated into pretty much every single language you can think of. They're super, super readable. Um, they can get pretty in depth at certain points, but they provide all the necessary information in that book for you to understand those uh, systems. If you're looking for something like living soil or um, no-till, I would really, really highly recommend Jeff Lowenfeld's Teeming With series. He's got three books. I believe there might be a fourth one published or a fourth one on the way. I don't remember exactly. Um, it's like teaming with microbes, teaming with fungi. Um, and then the, I, don't, I can't remember the third one. Really, really highly recommend those to anybody who's uh, more on the beginner side and just looking to get a really good grasp of them. You, in all honesty, can just get the first book, The Teaming with Microbes, and that book will teach you everything you need to know about the basics of soil science. It'll break it down into really simple language for you, really simple definitions, and it'll give you all the necessary, uh, essentially, foundation for you to understand that system as a whole. Um, if you're not into reading, I would really, really highly recommend Jeremy Silva from Build a Soil. Their YouTube channel has literally hundreds of hours of high quality, really in-depth um, content growing literally in their hydroponic shop. It's phenomenal. Um, I've actually met Jeremy in person. He's a really great guy. Um, grows great weed too. I can say that 100%. He's, he's given me samples of a couple things and everything I've smoked from him has been amazing so i those systems do work really well i would recommend all of those sources um if you're more of an old form kind of guy i would recommend going and looking for clackamas coot that guy will always have great information um he's he gets very detailed very quick so that might be somebody something for on the little bit more advanced spectrum his uh vocabulary will get really large really quick on you but uh those are a general direction for if you're looking for any of those types of systems and more information on them. Thank you very much. Kyle, Skristen, uh, any shout outs for uh, sources of information? Uh, yeah, well, I've already pretty much mentioned it all the time. Obviously, the Rev, uh, you know, he has his own YouTube uh, page now. So now he's starting to do that. So uh, that's kind of that's a little bit better because it actually shows he actually goes through and shows how he does everything. Uh, even, oh, that's great. Yeah, so even the mixing and stuff, he puts it on a large, uh, an example of a small scale and then how you would do it on a large scale. So it's kind of cool how he does it. And, uh, you know, he's a funny guy, too. So it's it's really cool because um, he's just an old stoner. So, uh, and then the other ones are Rodale's, uh, Rodale's ultimate encyclopedia for organic gardening. Uh, like I said, it has every, everything. It's not just cannabis. It has, uh, everything. And it's an older book. It's been around for a long, long time. Uh, another one's the composting for like recycling, uh, your soil and stuff. The Rodale's book of composting and, uh, for worms, uh, if you're doing any kind of worm bins, uh, worms, uh, eat, eat my garbage. That's a kid's book, but you know, it's an older one, but it's a, the basic, like first worm book that i know of so um yeah that's really basically it that i can think of uh because uh bunk had mentioned the lowenfels books I've, I've read those um and that's really pretty much all i can think of off the top of my head and i'm looking through my closet real quick at the books i have <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's okay we can always um we can always add stuff to the video description if we think of them later i'll try i'll try to remember to like link some of these things if i can when we publish the video, oh yeah, and, uh, that, yeah. oh and uh, I mean, if, if for anybody on the Discord, I have I I play, um, link all the uh, Rev's uh, YouTube stuff once it comes up. So I keep uploading. I I comment on the stuff and any so anytime yeah, Kyle, stuff comes up. So. You're a really good um, archivist, Kyle. Yeah, you've you upload lots of stuff. That's great. Uh, yeah, yeah, I really try. You know, that's that's kind of my thing. Uh, yeah, that's just uh, I'm kind of a historian type of thing. That's 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 my deal. So because I I really love it, man. So, <laughs> hell yeah, yeah, dude, I love your Instagram. 
Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the, I guess I could shout out myself. Uh, go to the Breacher Syndicate Instagram. It's, it's, <laughs> you can check out all of the some of the historical stuff. I don't put everything on there. Most of it's on the Discord, pretty much. But uh, every once in a while, I like to post historical stuff. And, uh, yeah, you can see some of my uh, plants on there, too, every once in a while. So Okay. I'll, again, I'll try to remember to link that, too. Um, Skristen. Uh, I got started, like, down this path from uh from coot just reading his stuff and uh but from there i mostly look at you know non canna stuff like most of it is just far farming youtubes and shit like that um yeah no that's great though that is a good point which yeah. is that you can look outside of like cannabis discourse for this yeah yeah, well, because I mostly, you know, I mostly focus on like making my own compost and stuff like that. Uh, that's that's what I, you know, mostly do like heavy research into. Yeah, check out that Rodales, man. You might you you you, you, you like that then. Ooh. Shoot me a, a link. Oh yeah, yeah, I will, man. I'll try to find it on Amazon. I'll send it to you. Awesome. Yeah, I'm going okay, to check out the Rev. His YouTube channel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I, man, I just yeah. looking for yeah, it. I couldn't funny. find it. I just like, I just like it. he's funny and, you know, he's not, he doesn't take himself seriously, man, and he's willing to admit mistakes. And, you know, you see his plants on there, you know, he shows everything. And yeah, that's what I like about him. He's transparent. And, yeah, he's, he's a really cool guy from, from what I've seen anyway. I don't know him personally, obviously. <laughs> Maybe if we actually get him on the show, we can get some of you back on to ask him questions. Um Oh man, that'd be yeah, because cool. Matt, you know, Matt and I are not really like the right people <laughs> to do that <laughs> for the organic stuff. So yeah, might need your help again, guys. Oh um, man, that'd be cool. So we're kind of in the like, really, we're wrapping up now. And uh, any final thoughts, Bumcat, or any other prompt uh, before we wrap up? Um. I this think has been we've pretty, pretty much pretty covered good. it. I th yeah, I'm gonna go through the real quick. Um, yeah, I think that's really that's really it. Um, yeah, I would really highly recommend anybody who wants to join the syndicate join the syndicate. It's a super fun group of people. We learn. I'm constantly learning from everybody in there. I've made a couple really really good friends. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, join the syndicate. <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah, any final thoughts or shout outs from Kyle or Skustin? Uh No, just thanks again for having me on. Uh, you know, I'm really honored that uh, you would, anybody would even think of me having me on because uh, I don't think very much myself. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, man. No, it's been a great enjoy, help, man. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely join the uh, syndicate. You know, it's always funny over there. You know, we're always joking around. So, uh, yeah. That's it. That's about it, man. Yeah, but don't don't join if you have very specific opinions that you're, you know, um, that you are offended if other people don't share. That's yeah, because because I can only step in the <laughs> ring so many times, you know. So. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, jump on in the Discord. It's well worth the five dollars. Uh, oh, yeah, exactly. and yeah, well, thank you guys so much. Um, like, it's always a great help, honestly, to get people from the community to come on the show. And I think it's been a great direction for us to move into as to, uh, to supplement and or complement like the other, other shows that we do. Um, it's really been, I think, a fun and productive set of conversations every time we do one of these i think i think people really enjoy it um shout out to matt who couldn't make it today um again yeah i did i did i did poke poke at matt a little bit sometimes he's not the most enthusiastic about growing episodes but you know he he still shows up and like <laughs> gives his two cents so we did miss him today and apologies to everyone that they have to stare at our avatar instead of matt's face because um, the other funny thing about Matt's face is that, like, he can't hide any reaction. 
Like if <laughs> if you're watching his face, and you, you see um, everything's written on his face, whether he likes yeah. something or he doesn't like something, you'll see it. <laughs> so yeah, we we're, we're missing out today, but that's all right. We'll get it back. Um, otherwise, yeah. Thanks everyone so much. Thanks for giving us your Friday evening. Uh, my last shout outs. I'll try to do this. I'll try to do the Matt thing. Uh, Riotseeds.com for um, Riot. Park, kind of lonesome. There's Jill, um, probably feeding people. Uh, I think the Rev might still have gear on there as well. Speaking of the Rev, um, we have Lifted, Lifted Genetics. Um, we have Grip by Seeds for Australia and New Zealand. And we have Riot Seco Europe for Europe. And join the Discord, as everyone has said multiple times this episode. It's a great place, uh, great times, great people. And that is all. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Want to sit at the table with the syndicate? Check out our Patreon in our link tree or description below. Our merch site is officially live. We have all sorts of shirts, hoodies, and goodies to sort you out. And shipping is super fast. And most importantly, the quality is top notch. I've been saving old designs for years for this purpose, so please check it out. Syndicategear.com we also have an underground syndicate discord where we get together and solve old strain history together daily. It's an amazing community of learning away from IG and it's an amazing resource for old catalogs and knowledge. We hope you join our union of breeders and growers. Come check it out.